Well, a very good morning uh, to you all uh, joining us for the launch of this year's Energy Barometer. My name's Nick Waith. I'm the Chief Executive of the Energy Institute. I'm here at our headquarters in London, um, feeling the heat. Um, for those of you uh, not in the southeast, uh, certainly things are heating up down here in London. I'm delighted to um, be chairing today's session. Uh, I'm joined by our newly elected president, uh, Juliet Davenport, um, the founder and former CEO of Good Energy, Professor Robert Gross, who is director at uh, UKIRK and a trustee of the Energy Institute. Uh, and regrettably, um, we were hoping to have Dr. Joanne Wade uh, with us today, and uh, she is unwell, so we wish her a speedy recovery. Um, so we'll be going through the, uh, the key findings of the barometer today. Please join the debate on social media, uh, hashtag energy barometer. Tweet your thoughts, your responses, um, and, uh, and, and please join in the debate. So before we get into the barometer, let me just give a, uh, for those of you not familiar with the Energy Institute, uh, a couple of comments on the Energy Institute. Um, we are a professional chartership body for people in energy uh, across the world. Uh, and our purpose is clearly stated um, to create a better energy future for our members and society by accelerating a just global energy transition to net zero. We do that through three key strategic themes. Number one, we seek to attract, develop and equip the future diverse energy workforce. Number two, we seek to inform energy decision making through convening the expertise and advice of you, our members and fellows. And that's absolutely what the barometer is about. And number three, enabling uh, industry and consumers to make energy uh, lower carbon and more efficient. So um, we've got members around the world, a broad tent of, of membership uh, and all united by one thing, a passion for energy and for improving the role that energy plays in the progress of humanity. Um, and, and let me just say a thanks to all of our members who have participated in responding to this year's barometer and indeed to our own team who've done the hard job of pulling it all together uh, under um, a lot of support from uh, Rob Gross and our uh, broader council. Um, so this is our eighth consecutive barometer. We, um, we follow the long-term trends in energy as well as seeking to sort of play into the, the issues of the moment. Uh, and each year members from the UK um, submit their views around the, the big trends of, of energy. Um, you know, and this is really part of our, of our role in helping inform decision makers. We've, we've used this already to engage with government. We'll be doing uh, other sessions with government, with policymakers, uh, and, and many others um, across the UK. And whilst this is a very UK um, focused survey, you know, the findings I'm sure in large are relevant in other parts of the world. So the context for this year's barometer is all about the triple energy crisis. Um, you know, it's, it's stating the obvious that we are in an unprecedented crisis, probably the biggest crisis we've experienced um, for many of us in living memory, certainly since the 1970s. Um, and we face a backdrop of a security crisis. Clearly the tragic war in Ukraine is going to have significant impacts on Europe, particularly this winter with 40% of uh, gas coming from Russia historically. And we face you know, real challenges as we enter the winter and potential shortages of, of uh, supply. A price crisis, which is impacting consumers around the world and, and you know, notably here in the UK, where some forecasters have predicted average bills of up to 3,400 pounds uh, coming in from this October and real hardship for consumers having to choose between whether they heat their homes, use energy, or put food on their tables. And finally, the climate crisis has not gone away. Um, and we've seen emissions rise by a record 6% in the last year. Um, and the trajectory towards a net zero remains high on everyone's agenda, but clearly some people are worried that um, the other crises of price and security of supply may impact our ability to deliver a net zero. 
So uh, as we go into the results of the survey this year, the top challenges unsurprisingly have come through as number one, the energy price crisis. And by the way, this was um, a free form text box. So the energy price crisis has come through as a you know, very significant um, factor, uh, up 19 points since last year, a focus on low carbon energy and energy security um, playing out. The solutions, um, energy efficiency comes through loud and clear with our members telling us that much more needs to be done on energy efficiency. Um, and a close second, the continued build out of low carbon renewable supply. And I think you know, the, the, the positive news, if there is positive news, is that the solutions for all three crises are actually more aligned. The notion of the old trilemma where one priority was fighting against Another priority is something I believe we've now moved on from. So with that, um, we're going to go into a bit more detail of the findings today. Um, and it's my pleasure now to hand over to uh, Professor Rob Gross, who will talk through uh, some of the responses around price. Good morning, Rob, and over to you. Hi, Nick. <clears throat> Thanks very much indeed. Uh, and uh, thanks also to the um, Energy Institute um, uh, Secretariat and team who've all obviously worked so hard to pull together all of the findings uh, from, from the, the survey of the memberships. It's, it really, really is a hugely, I think, important and interesting uh, barometer, quite literally, uh, of what energy professionals um, uh, think. So uh, I think my, my next a couple of slides are the ones uh, that Joanne Wade uh, would have covered because obviously she's far more, more of an expert on energy efficiency matters uh, the, than, uh, than me, um, but I'll do my best. Um, so are we moving on to those two slides? Great, so thanks very much. Um, so the first thing is we've got a couple of questions around energy efficiency and, uh, and reducing fuel poverty. And the membership, uh, the results from the survey here are, are really, really quite stark and dramatic. 70% uh, of respondents are not seeing energy efficiency uh, as having any kind of positive effect. And in fact, uh, significant fractions saying that it had a negative effect uh, on uh, improving energy efficiency uh, during the last uh, year. And uh, worst still, 90% uh, also see uh, fuel poverty as um, as also uh, uh, worsening and, uh, and policy not really working. Um, I mean, this is a very well versed and very well known uh, story. Um, energy efficiency retrofit into the domestic sector has been uh, has been quite largely stagnated for about the last decade. Uh, there's there's all, there, there are some policies that target the least you know the poorest households and social housing, but there's almost no policy at all for the able to pay. Um, and as a result, progress with upgrading the building stock has been really quite stagnant and you know, billions of pounds have been added to the nation's energy bills as, as a result. Um, lots of properties that low hanging fruit are still there. There's, there's, there's a third of properties don't have cavity wall insulation, for example, uh, and a huge amount could be done even by just moving uh, the kind of average performance rating up from, um, from grade D uh, to grade C, which could save about 500 pounds a year. So there's lots and lots that we could do on energy efficiency. Uh, next slide, please. And these are the recommendations that come from the, uh, that come out of the survey. Um, fairly straightforward, I won't read it all out. Um, there is stuff happening, uh, as, as I'm sure many of you are aware, uh, for the lowest income households, there's going to be, uh, uh, as is, I think coming through tomorrow, in fact, there's a one-off payment with another one that's uh, following in, in the autumn. Uh, the members also favour taking VAT off, off, off energy. I know it's been taken off some energy efficiency products, um, but uh, what the membership weren't particularly keen on is uh, giving a rebate to, to everybody, including, of course, those who potentially aren't being particularly negatively affected because they're affluent enough to be able to weather it out from, uh, for themselves. Um, and then we have uh, the need for, for really getting on with it, uh, a nationwide retrofit program. Uh, yes, of course, we're not gonna get every house uh, in, re-insulated -insul and up to scratch in time for next winter. 
Uh, but that's not a reason not to get on with it. We really do need to get on with it, do something permanent, uh, a nationwide energy efficiency endeavor. Um, and the first step towards that, and this is something that I very firmly support and have advocated for wearing my UKIRK hat uh, myself, and that's that we could be having, I know that the government in the energy efficiency, energy security strategy announced a new website, a portal energy efficiency advice, but it's quite underplayed and low key. That could be a major push for this win for this summer to get ready for next winter with advice and information, um, using trusted agencies to get through to consumers. And it seems to me a bit of a, to put it mildly, a, a missed opportunity there. And then the final thing is the importance of uh, building up skills and the supply chain. So prioritizing these green jobs uh, that we know are there, uh, hugely well aligned with the leveling up agenda right across the country. Uh, and it's gonna be a, an investment program that runs out over, over not just years, but decades. So a ter terrific win-win and opportunity. Next slide, please. And next slide, please. Okay, so um, moving on from the energy efficiency side of things uh, to talk about uh, energy security and security of supply. Um, there's a couple of uh, slides here uh, that, that, that are around the kind of um, the energy, the wider uh, energy um, markets, markets for, uh, uh, for, for oil and gas, and then around reform of those markets. So specifically, um, the, uh, the survey asked how best the UK can phase out uh, Russian oil imports in the short to medium term. And the, the, the survey came back as, uh, again, emphasizing the importance of energy efficiency, as well as the kind of short term maximization of, of, our, of our own oil and gas. Um, but I think it's really important that we see this in a, in a broader geopolitical context, and in particular in a European context. Um, we are I mean, Brexit is, you know, notwithstanding and, and to, I would hope in some respects irrelevant, we're in a, an interconnected uh, gas market uh, with the EU and Norway. We still produce uh, uh, from our own uh, continental shelf. We've also got a uh, significant amount of LNG import capacity, which our part of Europe currently lacks. They have storage that we lack. Uh, it seems to me that there's really quite straightforward uh, uh, requirement for us to have a Western European uh, collaborative effort uh, to, to ensure our, our security of supply. We, we have our own target to uh, only a very relatively small fraction of our total gas molecules um, originate in Russia, as it were. Uh, but we're in, we're in a European market. Prices are set uh, you know, on a regional basis around the world. What happens in other parts of the world affect the prices here. And so we're all in this together in collaboration. Uh, needs to be the the order of the day. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and I think this is uh, the final one from me, which is that um, we asked about uh, uh, the, the reforming markets, um, and this is an interesting one. Uh, it's it's not perhaps quite as easy to uh, interpret what the uh, what the membership was uh, was quite what was in everyone's minds. Um, only a third support um, a windfall tax, uh, but, but almost half uh, support some form of, uh, of kind of government intervention uh, to try and improve the situation in energy markets. And three quarters advocate reform, uh, whether that's radical or, in, uh, or incremental, of the international uh, oil and gas markets. Now, these, these, these questions weren't terribly specific, and it's, uh, I think, quite possible that. Um, uh, that different uh, different members might have had quite sort of more thinking about different things. Some might have been thinking, for example, about the, um, the spot markets uh, for LNG. Others might have been thinking about electricity markets. Um, but we certainly sense, I think the, the, the survey brings, the, the, that three quarters is quite telling uh, in terms of some sort of the, the unease uh, with the way that international oil and gas markets are functioning, particularly as you as many of you will know, there's been a big push towards a decoupling the price of, uh, uh, of gas from the price of oil, moving away from oil index, long run contracts and much more towards a spot market approach, a liberalization agenda that was actually championed by, by the UK when we were still in the EU, which has now become very much the kind of thrust of what's been achieved in the EU. And in, to a certain extent, you could say that we're now 
um, that that's that, that that that's great when we're in a world of it's very efficient when we're in a world of low prices. Um, we might pause for thought when we're in the world of, of a price crisis and draw some comparisons with the uh, the longer term contracts that are still quite prevalent in parts of Asia, for example, um, and might be providing some kind of buffer against uh, the very the very very high. We, if we want an LNG shipment to come here, we have to pay top price, and that already you can see the government uh, responding to trying to think about how we might ease that, re reopening the rough storage. Um, facility and, uh, and and various other things and contracts being entered into by companies in our market to try to uh, to try to de deliver a, a, a secure supply over a longer period of time. I mean, second thing here that I think is very important is there's a there's a conversation now in uh, in the UK but also more widely across countries in Europe um, about the uh, really quite stark uh, paradox, if you like. Um, that we now know that, um, that renewables at current prices and uh, existing nuclear is delivering, able to deliver electricity way below uh, the kind of current wholesale market prices that we're seeing. I looked yesterday and the, um, the day ahead price was over £300 per megawatt hour in a day of not particularly high demand. So um, uh, UCA, for example, my, my research uh, institute has advocated for um, running some contracts for different options for existing generation and trying to get more of that uh, existing generation onto a, a longer term and lower priced contract. That was a kind of an emergency response that we suggested could be put in place in time for next winter because the policy levers are already all there. Um, but we've also seen, for example, EDF in France has done a deal effectively with the, with the French government to deliver the nu nuclear power below uh, wholesale market price. And the issue here is that wholesale market prices are set by the marginal unit. The marginal unit is usually a gas-fired unit and therefore the price of gas sets the price of electricity. And uh, as I was saying in the context of, um, of, of the international gas market, that's all quite fine uh, when we're in a benign price environment. Uh, it doesn't seem to be quite so fine uh, we're in, when we're in a crisis. And so understandably members I think are commenting on that and we're seeing that conversation still playing out. Um, that's it from me. I think I'm uh, um, I'm handing I'm handing back to Nick, or am I handing over to? Uh, well, we're going to go straight on to Juliet, please, Rob. So thank you so much, and Juliet, okay. over to you. Uh, Nick, Rob, thank you very much for that oversight of of the of the um, energy barometer so far. I mean, for me, what's quite interesting about this is that. Uh, what we summarized is that energy efficiency is the mainstay. We absolutely need to improve energy efficiency across the board to make any of these policies work and to be given a real chance to deliver on zero carbon. And I think what, what I find fascinating about this is that this is this has been an ignored area for so long. Um, and it's it's something that really we need to bring to the forward as a kind of emergency measure. Um, as Rob said, market reform coming through is a really strong second. And I think uh, for me, market reform is we needed to, we needed to have started this probably about five years ago, but we're getting into it now. Um, it is going to be about how this these marketplaces are going to change and actually how you dispatch renewables is completely different from from what we've done with fossil fuels previously. And then, of course, the storage issue, the short term storage issue requirement that we need across Europe and collaborating across those. So those three areas are really strong, suggesting that we are lacking in policy areas and we need to move faster and more dynamically. Anyway, what I'm hoping to do is come to the areas that are a little bit stronger. Um, and I'm going to start uh, the first one. If we go to the next slide, thank you. Um, it, it, the second most important response to the current crisis, according to the survey, is around building out low carbon power generations and, and renewables in particular. And what is really interesting about this seems to be an area where um, the Energy Institute members feel that we've made positive uh, inroads into that and government is getting a lot of these things right. So the sentiment remains strong. Um, it's slightly down from last year. And, and what's interesting about that, it, it's, it's interesting whether this is a political piece, whether this is about um, what we're currently seeing, the fact that we're having a leadership crisis right now, or whether that is the impact of the um, energy crisis over the winter. 
it may be a little bit of both. Um, it feels like we've slightly gone off the boil uh, in terms of this and we need to keep focus on it. So um, although really positive, it's obviously an area that could lose focus if we're not careful. Um, uh, sort of most other areas of policy seem to have stayed relatively static in comparison to last year, sort of new nuclear um, and uh, sort of what, what I think, again, we're talking about here, uh, low carbon transport, um, supporting of low carbon heat is behind as we expected. Um, and that is one area that obviously government still hasn't quite got its made its decision up or got its head around. Um, so I think those are the sentiments that we're seeing coming through on this slide. I mean, what, what is really interesting, and Rob noted on that, that generating electricity from renewables has really demonstrated the capability of bringing those prices down. And I think onshore wind since 2010, down 40%, PV down 85%. There, there are no other technologies in play at the moment that are really seeing that dramatic drop in costs. And the CFD auction saw 11 gigawatts of renewables contracted for nearly four times less the current cost of gas. That is massive. I mean, if, if I, I started on this journey nearly 20 years ago, if I predicted this 20 years ago, um, they probably would have exiled me to another country. I mean, nobody believed that this was possible. And in some ways, I think that's what's so positive about this. Um, it is not just the fact that we've got policy area, it's got policy area that's had an impact and actually brought real costs down. Um, the CFD point that Rob is making is really interesting because Part of that is actually protecting consumers as well. So um, renewables to date have given under the CFD contracts that we've seen, particularly on onshore wind, but some of the offshore as well, have been giving money back to consumers through suppliers as a result of the CFD mechanism. And that, that's quite interesting because potentially CFD gives a long term hedge, both for um, the technology side, but also from the consumer side. Um, and I think uh, hopefully the, the combination of these cost effective technologies with energy efficiency, um, that could give us an exit strategy from this current en energy crisis that we're seeing. Um, could we go to the next slide, please? Um, in terms of net zero, obviously, I mean, at COP26 seems like eons ago. Um, it was, we hosted it in Glasgow. But since then, obviously, we've crashed into this energy crisis and that has been the currency of all the debate. However, obviously, there was there was quite a lot of positive commentary around um, emulating UK success on brokering multilateral deals, which is an important part of hosting COP, of COP and particularly around coal and methane deforestation, clean energy and finance. Um, but despite this, we've seen it slightly slip. And as I said, I think this feels like uh, the UK has slightly taken its eye off the ball um, and, and whether it's been distracted by the energy crisis or distracted by its own politics, it doesn't feel like we're, we're really um, uh, seeing that confidence build. And uh, we're seeing nearly 70% don't believe that we will get to uh, the close to the target comparison to 54% last year. So there is an con increasing concern amongst professionals that we're not going to hit these targets. Um, and only 5% actually think we will. So those are the optimists. Um, I might be in that camp occasionally. Um, I think optimism is a good piece, but cynicism is also helpful to really keep the pressure on making sure that we do that. Um, I think, I think it's, it's based on the current view of policies. It feels, as we said, renewables have got, uh, it feels like government's got those right. Energy efficiency has got a gap. Security supply has got a gap. Um, and heat has got a massive gap. I think um, low carbon vehicles feels like it's it's moving forward and there's, there's a new story on EV every day of the week. Um, I think there's a concern, uh, and this was shared by the Climate Change Committee in recent progress reports that we're not delivering in certain key areas. And although there are movements of it, we're not moving forward on every single front. Um, I think people are feeling that the escalation in gas prices will help rather than hinder the energy transition, although that's 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 very close run in terms of those. And, and I think it is too close to call whether we'll get distracted into trying to fix this problem and invest in technologies that will, will, will create long-term balance sheet issues. Um, and almost half have introduced, um, in, in terms of influencing their own organizations, 
Um, I think that's really interesting. And this is actually something that we can all do in our daily lives, whether it's in our homes or working with through businesses, is influencing energy efficiency or emission reduction measures over the past year um, due to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And I think there is this moment in time where people come together uh, over just talking about energy efficiency. If we talk about energy efficiency, improving, um, the, reducing the impact of Ukraine on the UK, um, I think that's massive. Um, and so there's some really interesting pieces coming through here, but fundamentally, um, there's some po really positive pieces, but we've got some big gaps. And on that, Nick, I'm going to hand back to you. Thank you so much, Juliet and Rob. And um, we're going to open it up to questions and answers now. So Juliet and Rob, please keep your cameras on. And I think we're going to go to full screen mode so you can see us all properly. Um, so thanks for all the questions that are coming in. They're coming thick and fast, and there's some really great questions coming in. I'm going to do my best to get through as many of those as we can. Um, really good question from Bob Ward, actually, um, who's asked, what will the EI do to ensure recommendations are put to the new government? Um, I'll perhaps ask Juliet, as our newly elected president, to um, respond to that, and maybe I'll, I'll chip in. And of course, Rob, you're welcome to as well. Well, I mean, I think as always, we would always seek to look, uh, sort of try and um, book a meeting with the minister and the secretary of state, but also the opposition and, and collaborate with other organisations who have a similar view. Because I think quite often what I find in these situations is that more than one voice saying the same thing it has a real power with government. Um, I think us coming out with this now is really timely. It's fantastic. And we can just build on that. But we're going to have to wait till things settle down so we know who to go to see for a while. Well, I guess that there is true to that. Although you know, the civil servants are still there. We, we, is true. we do regularly meet with Bayes. Um, I'll be attending uh, an all-party um, parliamentary group next week um, on energy costs. So we we are feeding this in. Um, we are promoting everything that the Energy Institute does, including our own energy aware training program, our chartered energy manager training and so on and so forth. But as always, more to be done on that. So the two words that have come out so regularly in today's session are energy efficiency. Um, and there's a lot of questions on that. I'm gonna try and couple some of these questions together. Um, so a great question from Ella Jennings. Um, what do we actually mean by energy efficiency? Are we talking about energy use, de device efficiency, demand reduction, all of the above, which is likely to be the most impactful? So if you can just hold that, Juliet and Rob, you know, firstly, what do we mean by that? And, and then some other questions to build on in respect of that as to, um, again, yeah, what should the Energy Institute do around energy efficiency? Um, and, you know, shouldn't we just see high prices as, as an opportunity to actually focus on energy efficiency in a far more concerted effort? So um, can I go to Rob and, and maybe ask you and then Juliet to come in on what do we mean by energy efficiency and of those different drivers? And I'm sure other drivers around that topic, which is likely to be the most impactful? Uh, I think what we're really talking about, I mean, I'm looking at the chat. And I'm um, seeing this the kind of conversation about energy efficiency and, 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 and demand reduction. Um, I mean, in the context of the uh, of the barometer questions, uh, we we asked our membership about energy efficiency. Uh, we didn't ask our our, our membership uh, about about demand reduction. And I'm obviously familiar with the arguments around you know, rebound effects and whether or not energy efficiency delivers absolute reductions in demand. Um, but we have seen absolute reductions in demand uh, as a result of energy efficiency, and that's, I mean, that's unequivocally the case uh, in terms of, um, of, of aspects of electricity uh, uh, demand, for example, uh, the demand or the need for light uh, uh, largely saturates, uh, irrespective of the fact that you might have moved uh, from an incandescent bulb uh, to an LED and be using something like a tenth of the electricity doesn't mean you turn on 10 more lights, right? So yes, there are issues around uh, around rebound effects. Those rebound effects can be more profound uh, in some uh, energy use uh, sectors than others uh, where perhaps there's unmet demand. And certainly for some uh, consumers, uh, domestic energy efficiency improvement is, uh, we would expect to see that uh, some of that used in comfort taking, 
And that's absolutely right, because if your home is too cold to be comfortable and better insulation allows you to use the same amount of energy or even slightly less energy and be warmer, uh, then, then that's exactly what that uh, objective of that policy is, is, is seeking to deliver. But in the context of you know, the broader piece and the energy crisis, I think it's quite clear that what our membership is talking about is the potential for effective policy to improve energy efficiency through things like building insulation to contribute to absolute demand reduction. And so I think there's a straightforward uh, link through there. Um, we haven't really spoken very much and perhaps Joanne, if she had not had COVID and was here, uh, we might be able to say more about and in a more informed way than me, but we haven't really had a conversation so much yet this morning about behavior. So whilst um, we would want, uh, to, and it's very clear that the barometer is advocating for improvements in energy efficiency, uh, as in technical measures to reduce the amount of energy input you need for an energy service output to reduce demand. The other ways in which we can reduce demand is by changing our behaviors or changing our transport patterns. Uh, in a wider climate context, uh, looking at our diet and the amount of meat that we eat, uh, but in the domestic context also about how for the able to pay, for the more affluent households, for uh, the people that have got comfortable wearing you know, short and t-shirts through the winter, uh, there are things that could be done and the, and the EU 10 point plan very, very strongly advocated for a uh, you know, one degree reduction in, uh, in thermostat to help reduce uh, gas demand. Now that's a politically difficult conversation to have in a country that has the worst insulated building stock in Europe, because too many people are in fuel poverty. And so the, the conversation immediately spills across into, surely you're asking poor people to be even older than they already are. And that's not how the conversation should be framed, but the conversation around behavior change is difficult because of that. And so you need to see the two things in, in concert with one another. We need to fix the problem we've got with energy efficiency and our energy efficiency standards being uh, quite low. But we ought to be able to have a conversation about thinking about how you can reduce your consumption if you're in a position to do so. Thanks, Bob. And, and this is such a big topic. I'd like to sort of just spend a bit more time around energy efficiency. And there's lots of questions coming in from all different sorts of perspectives. But um, Juliet, you know, you talk powerfully about energy efficiency. Um, any points you would add to Rob's comments there? Yeah, I mean, if you look overall at a system point of view, um, essentially one of the things we're doing is we're changing a system that was built in a, in a high carbon world. So in other words, you're changing a system that was centralized system based around 30 to 40 large power stations to a decentralized system now with significant numbers of embedded renewable generation, which is also variable. So you, you're changing the way we manage the whole system. Now, one of the things that we've never focused on, and, and I remember this when I joined the industry, is that um, a lot of the big CEOs about 20 years ago wouldn't talk about households, they wouldn't talk about consumers, they wouldn't talk about customers, they talk about meters. And, and it was very much thought that the electrical energy system was got as far as the meter and didn't go beyond. What was, what was happening on the other side of the meter was kind of irrelevant and everybody was sort of the same and they all watched the same TV programs, they all watched it. And so, so demand management was just thought of as a sort of conglomeration. Um, I think fundamentally what, what we can do with demand, if we can fundamentally reduce demand, and, and the estimates that I've seen looking at insulating properties in the UK properly, we could drop demand by up to 30% energy demand. And what that means is it puts less stress through the whole system. It means that if you have to manage variable renewables, you're having to manage less of them rather than more, because you're not going to have to build so much renewables, and therefore you're not going to have as much variability. So I think, I think first of all, we absolutely have to reduce the baseline and we have to focus on that and I mean I have my personal views I think we should be rolling that out as a national program on a regional basis we should take it out of the way it's being done on a piecemeal one by one basis at the moment uh, and really go for it and and part of that will build one a supply chain because I think one of the biggest challenges in the UK is that we haven't got scale so we haven't got a slight supply chain scale to go with it 
Um, I think we need obviously a massive training capability and knowledge, but also I mean, anybody who lives in this country knows that the buildings tend to be regional or even street by street. And that understanding a building and having a knowledge of a type of building will improve our ability to roll out energy efficiency. Um, just touching on demand side response, because we've had quite a lot of commentary on it, also a really important part. That begins to play into the flexibility markets that then address your variability related to renewables. And it's a key part, again, of taking the stress out of the system. Right now, pretty much, although we're beginning to see some more agile tariffs come through, which is great, historically, most people in the UK know when to get on a train. You know that if you get on a train between certain hours, it's more expensive. The majority of people in the UK do not know when power is more expensive. And that's because that's never really been reflected through to the end user. And actually giving the end user an opportunity to be part of that and help solve that problem rather than creating the problem can really help in terms of reducing the cost as well to everybody in terms of delivering on this low carbon system. So, so I think you need to roll out a mass energy efficiency program that improves the um, insulation, but at many levels within the building. There's some, there's some brilliant apps now coming out so you can do your own EPC analysis, et cetera, et cetera. Energy aware, obviously amazing piece of technology um, focused on businesses, but we can use it for domestic households as well. And I think these, these are really important baseline. Then you get to milestone response then you get all the flexibility technologies on top of that. Fabulous, Juliet, thank you. And, and, and building on that, a few specific questions I'll just go through. So um, question from Steve Harper, who's asked why, and, and this may be a, a level of detail that we don't have an answer to, but um, why is it that the price cap doesn't apply to, to multi-residency um, properties? Um, and is that something the Energy Institute should lobby government on? St uh, Steve, thanks for the question. I mean, we don't lobby government, I should be very clear. Um, we do speak with government, we don't lobby government. Um, and then a, a, an interesting sort of proposition um, that's come in from Chris Jones. Um, could we link EPC ratings to stamp duty discounts and multipliers? So effectively, the you know, better EPC rating would have a lower stamp duty and therefore incentivize um, both buyers and sellers in the market. I don't know, Juliet or Rob, if you want to comment on either of those points. Um, and um, I, I guess maybe a more overarching question. I mean, the concept of energy efficiency is not new. Um, for anybody who was around in the 1970s, and I can't claim to remember much of the 1970s, but I was there, you know, the focus of driving cars more slowly was, was well known, that drove speed limits. Um, and here we are sort of 40, 50 years on. What is it about behavioral change campaigns that the government has done historically that haven't meant that we've actually made the changes we need to? Um, any views on that, Juliet? Why, why has policy failed in this area? I think because um, it's, it's a difficult area to really focus on um, and it it was put into a particular area of it, it it was seen to be paid for by the suppliers the energy suppliers um, and under the mechanisms that we saw there were there were basically there was a charge on the energy bill that then went to energy efficiency and I don't think we ever really broke it out of that and it, there was always this conflict between you've got a bunch of energy companies who make more money when they sell more energy um, yet you're asking them to implement a program of energy efficiency. And, and that's in direct conflict of, of everything they do. So you, you, you almost have to create a separate business within that. And I've always found that if you want the energy companies to pay for it, fine, but use a separate mechanism to get somebody else to go and do the energy efficiency because you've got the wrong natural incentives working either. You're always working against those. So you then have to increase the regulation and the regulator has to be much tighter on it. I also think what it meant was that you couldn't do um, that, that you couldn't get, you couldn't as engage, you could engage local authorities, but not as much. So I just think a regional basis where you actually work with people on the ground who can get involved. Because one of the other things is people don't like coming into other people's homes or people don't like people coming into their homes. They want to trust people. And my feedback is that the trust in the energy sector, particularly the supplier sector, is not very high. So would you trust them to do your energy efficiency when you don't think that they're giving you the right bill? Probably not. And I think there's a trust piece in here that has been undermined. 
And, and government just has, I think it's been too comfortable. Everybody's been comfortable with where it is because they knew what the system was. But what it did wasn't doing was delivering for the for the um, man in the street or the woman in the street. So that that's your dilemma is that the industry itself, the energy efficiency kind of sort of lobby was very comfortable with what it was because because they knew how to work it. What you didn't deliver to was the national targets and and the individual basically. So switching from energy efficiency, we, we may well come back to energy efficiency because I'm I'm seeing all the chat back and forth. But let, but let's switch to uh, supply of, of natural gas and oil. And uh, a question in from Abdul Latif uh, Al Batawi, um, who's I guess in Abu Dhabi. So good to hear you on the on the webinar this morning. Um, can switching to um, other oil and gas suppliers um, help phase out Russian imports? And then link to that a question coming in on you know. So when can we expect to see North Sea? production ramping up um, and I guess linked to that, will that make a difference on supply costs? Um, so Rob, would you like to have a go at tackling those questions, please? Uh, yeah, uh, I, I, I'm not an expert on the UKCS uh, uh, production uh, uh, increase uh, potential. So I, I really I really can't comment on that. Um, I, I, other than to say that, you know, we know that our domestic uh, uh, resources depleting that we know that it's been in decline for uh, you know 20 years or so we know that that will continue that we know that when the when, when the price is you know ex extremely high then then it is more attractive to to go to less what would otherwise be um, uh, less attractive um, resources because they'd otherwise be be a bit too expensive but I mean Nick you've got perhaps a background in the oil industry that places you a bit more uh, effectively to answer the question than, than, than I do about the UKCS, but in terms of um, uh, reducing our dependency on Russia, uh, in, I mean, yes, I mean, the whole EU plan is focused on the mobilising as much LNG import into Europe as it possibly can, as well as uh, maximising output from EU or Norway or uh, uh, UK stroke GB um, uh, uh, production uh, capacity. And in that regard, I think it's uh, regrettable that the EU greyed out the, uh, the, the Milford Haven and, uh, and, and GB LNG terminals uh, as if they didn't exist, whilst kind of fretting about the fact that the capacity in Iberia was kind of stranded because it, there's not enough interconnection across into northwestern Europe when we've you know, when, for example, the Milford Haven, uh, the whole project was predicated on our, our role in the EU um, gas, integrated gas market. So, I mean, those kind of European politics things, I think, are, are, are really, really relevant here. But just to come back to one of the points that I was making about the, the LNG trade, um, it's, a, it's a globally interconnected uh, market. So if it's if it's if it's coming out of the Middle East, for example, those tankers are basically going to turn right or they're going to turn left. Um, and so the, it's the price differential between what is being paid for, for for shipments to come into Europe rather than shipments to go to Asia. And obviously, there's there has been an uptick in the transatlantic trade as well. Um, but you know that we could have a whole seminar, or in fact, you know, a whole master's degree course to to explore. Uh, some of these options, it's clear that the EU and the UK governments are both working, perhaps not as much in cohort as I would like them to, to mobilise as much non-Russian gas import as possible. But we can't ignore the reality of the fact that something like 40% of EU gas is, is coming through pipelines across the continent of Europe into Russia. Uh, and changing that with it, with it in, in a matter of months uh, is obviously extraordinarily difficult slash impossible. But at some point, I'd like to come back to some of the energy efficiency stuff, but I'll, I'll leave it there for now. Well, I'm sure we'll come back to that, Rob. Um, I mean, just just on the sort of, you know, the question around um, hydrocarbon production in the UK, I mean, it is an emotive topic. I, I, know, I know that there are those that will call for, you know, no further um, investment in, in UK oil and gas production. I, I also think there's been a massive amount of hypocrisy, if I can use such a strong word, within Europe, where effectively in many jurisdictions, the development of natural gas has been banned. Um, 
and we've been importing 40% of that natural gas from a country which is now at war with another country in Europe. Um, I mean, to me, we need to kind of cut through the emotion of this debate and, and, and really have a sensible conversation. I do think there is something about thinking about, you know, if you think about every barrel um, being different, you know, the, the carbon impact from you know, one barrel to the next is not the same. We know that oil sands barrels tend to have a higher carbon output. We know that some of the barrels that come from the North Sea, particularly the Norwegian sector, where many of the offshore platforms are electrified, can be significantly lower. So I, I think we need to somehow get through the emotion of this. Um, you know, I, I, you know, my personal view is, you know, fracking onshore UK is not going to magically come to the rescue. We're, you know, it's, it's highly unlikely we can replicate anything um, that the US has seen. But I also think we must not dogmatically ban um, production from the North Sea. And I also think the way that some of the large energy companies are targeted by protesters means that those assets then go to other developers who might not develop those assets to the same standards that the large operators would. So it's a complex, difficult, emotive subject, but I think we need to be a bit more honest and, and transparent about what's actually going on because banning hydrocarbon production in one country and then importing it from somewhere else where the carbon output could be higher is not going to help us in the long run. Um, so um, let's come back to sort of uh, energy efficiency. And, and there's a question, there's a lot of debate going on, some people disagreeing in a, in a friendly, polite manner <laughs> on the chat, which is great to see. Um, a question coming in from Claire Carden um, asking about how we think about the embedded carbon um, going into low carbon solutions. If we think about things like heat pumps and refrigerants, um, yeah, obviously they're seen as part of the solution, but inevitably there's a carbon um, embodied in, in everything we do uh, in the energy system. So maybe Juliet and, and, and back to Rob on, on that point. Yeah, I mean, I think you have to look at all the materials that go into any low carbon solution. And, and this was one of the things that was picked up very early on kind of uh, as, as the wind revolution came through and then the solar revolution. I mean, I think wind, my recollection on wind is the carbon payback on wind is about three to six months. I think solar is slightly longer than that. Um, I mean, the biggest the biggest bills we see, I mean, the, the, is concrete. Concrete is one of the, the highest carbon sort of pieces of anything. So, I mean, the, the, the re recent nuclear build is one of the biggest um, concrete pores in the world. Um, over the last kind of 10 years. And I think we just need to, you're right, we need to look at these technologies. In terms of heat pumps, um, I, I don't actually have the data on heat pump, but I think my sense is it's it, it's nothing, it's not a massive concrete pour um, you're using, unless you're gonna replace all the existing infrastructure within a home, you're, you can use the existing infrastructure to a point. Um, there, there's some adaptations that you do need to do at, from time to time. But all these technologies have an impact. Nothing, you don't get away for free from nothing. The point is to do an analysis of what is the least worst approach. Um, and also what we need to do is have an enduring technology that then can continue to produce and continue to produce at low carbon. I, I, just to come back to you, Nick, on, on the price cap piece um, and, and the landlords piece, just to be clear, um, I think that there might have been some confusion in the question. Um, a landlord cannot uh, pass electricity and gas costs at any higher than a than the price cap. That that is illegal. The 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 reference I think was to a heating system, so as to to localized communal heating systems, where they can change the price because heat at the moment is not covered by the price cap. So that is different from electricity and gas. So just to be clear on that, um, and and I think this is this is part of the point I made earlier is the the suite of policies and thinking around heat uh, and what heat networks and, and how we provide heat going forwards in a low carbon way have not been properly thought through. And this, this is one of the gaps we're, we're seeing as well. Thank you for clarifying that, Julia. And, and Rob, you wanted to come back in on energy efficiency. So um, back to you. Uh, yeah, thanks, Nick. I mean, just I, I'll take the most recent uh, sort of questions around embodied uh, emissions and so on. I think we, it's very important to be clear that if you've got gas-fired power stations, you've got 450 grams uh, per kilowatt hour coming out of the stack. For coal-fired power stations, you've got 900 grams per kilowatt hour. And exactly in exactly the same way, you've got completely unabated uh, uh, emissions of CO2 from a gas 
uh, from a gas boiler. Um, there's obviously embodied energy in, in, in making a wind farm or building a nuclear power station, typically in the range of about 10 grams per kilowatt hour on a whole life basis, up to uh, multiples of 10, perhaps even as high as, as, as 100 grams per kilowatt hour. If you, were to build, if you were to manufacture your solar panels in a country that was running entirely on coal and then put them somewhere not very sunny, your, uh, your embodied emissions would obviously be quite high. If you manufactured your solar panels in Norway and put them into the, the desert, uh, your embodied emissions per kilowatt hour would obviously be quite low. All of these are kind of contingent uh, issues. And the key thing here is that you have the capability over time to control those embodied emissions by decarbonizing the energy sources uh, that go into the, into the construction of those technologies. Slightly different issue with concrete, which I concur with Juliet on. And another issue again around uh, refrigerant gases, uh, which obviously have a very high global warming uh, potential themselves. And if we have basically an awful lot more uh, heat pumps and refrigeration units running, then the key challenge there is that you have end of life regulation that, that makes sure that you're not releasing to atmosphere and that they're well maintained so they're not leaking. Because yes, there could be a, a, a global warming backfire um, associated with that. Uh, there's an awful lot going on um, in, in the chat uh, around energy efficiency. So the only thing that I would add to, 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 the, to that conversation is intervention points. I think there was a question about um, links to stamp duty, the role of suppliers and the role of trust. So what we need to think about is what the intervention points are for major energy efficiency retrofit. It's very unlikely that, that the majority of householders even at a time of very high energy prices, are going to say, well, do you know what, for no other reason, I'm going to go through the huge disruption of having my internal walls clamped uh, this summer. Um, even though and a small number of households might respond to uh, purely to the price of energy and want to go and do that. But the intervention point comes when you're building a loft conversion or when you're having renovation work done to your kitchen. And so that's when the levers need to be pulled. And the, the problem that we've had is that we had, it was, and Juliet's right, that it was very much focused on energy suppliers, but we did have a program that was very much focused on the, or, or an obligation, set, set of obligations on energy suppliers that was until it was largely uh, wound up and focused only on, the, um, only on the poorest households, delivering energy efficiency improvements. Now, maybe it was getting the low hanging fruit, but some of the low hanging fruit still exists. We then had two attempts to provide loans or grants or financial assistance to able to pay households, both of which uh, didn't, were unsuccessful. And so there's a, there's a challenge to thinking through um, how, uh, how, to, how to address that. Joanne, if she was here, was, uh, was because I know from her notes, uh, is very keen on the kind of, uh, kind of place-based approach, the regional approach that's been quite successful in the States. I can't speak in detail to that, I'm afraid, because I don't, uh, I don't have the expertise, but we certainly need to be thinking about, and there's a large social science literature about how people engage with their energy. And we need to be thinking about and benef benefiting from and learning from that. And then finally, uh, Nick and I'll shut up. The price cap's bust, okay? What we found with the price cap is that you can't have a downstream retail uh, price cap to protect consumers when the upstream uh, prices of, of the input commodities have gone through, the, you know, have increased sixfold. In the Iberian Peninsula, Spain and Portugal, they've actually put in place a wholesale market price cap, and they're then recompensing the gas fired generators as a means to push, to force down the price, the wholesale uh, electricity price, uh, which as you might imagine, has raised more than eyebrows uh, within the European Commission, and is a very radical, and quite dramatic intervention, but then we're in a very dramatic situation. I'll stop. And I'm just reflecting upon that point. Surely within that, you are also increasing, you know, of sustaining demand for what otherwise would have fallen. But um, yeah, there's there's lots of issues, and all of these things have unintended consequences. Big right? big questions about how we finance this. I mean, I, to me, the the biggest frustration is virtually energy any energy efficiency project is net positive in terms of value, and it's just how you finance that in a way that allows consumers 
and industry to understand it and to access it. I mean, that's to me, I, I did the calculations on replacing an LED bulb and an LED bulb can pay back for itself in a matter of weeks. But I mean, kind of linked to that point, and it's a question from Isol, and this will probably be the last question we'll have a time to get to. I mean, it was quite striking that the number of our members thinking that we are not going to reach net zero or get close to it has increased from 54 to 70% this year. So now, a large majority of our members are not confident that the UK will reach net zero. And this question is basically, you know, agree with the need to get to net zero, but aren't we making the, the danger of the UK becoming uncompetitive globally if we focus on net zero at the expense of competition? Um, back to you, Julia, how would you respond to that question? Well, I, and I think what's quite interesting about that is that actually I think we're doing a real missed opportunity because what you find in competition is competition isn't, isn't about um, how cheap everything is. Competition is about expertise, particularly in the UK. It's about capability. It's about IP. And actually, if we are forging ahead, developing the systems that will be able to manage flexibility, bringing down costs, thinking about new things, we have amazing R&D programs in this country. We've, we've, what's brilliant in the last, so in uh, October last year, we refocused our R&D into energy for the first time in, well, 20 years at least. Um, and that, what that means is that we can get ahead from a competition point of view in that sense. I think on the other side of it is that renewables are at their lowest costs. So why wouldn't you? I mean, it makes no sense whatsoever to go after high cost technologies that are also high carbon. Why not go for the low cost technologies that are low carbon and then start to work through what the problems are? I always, I always remember the example of Ben and Jerry's. And one of the things, the reason why the Americans are so good at making ice cream is because they love ice cream. They have an amazing domestic market in ice cream. And so they've been fantastic exporting it. And if we have an amazing domestic market in renewables and associated technologies, we'll be great at exporting it. Yeah. Well, that's a great note to end on, Julia, and a very positive note. And it's a view that I personally share. I, I do think the UK has a huge opportunity to actually play a leading role in, in the net zero transition. Um, and I think that will be good for UK PLC, good for the workforce. Um, and clearly, you know, we would love the Energy Institute to play a significant role in that. So um, I'm afraid that brings us to the end of today's session. I know we could have spent all day talking about it. Thank you to everybody who's raised questions. Sorry if we didn't get to your questions. Please keep the debate going on social media. You can see the hashtag there. Um, for Twitter and you can join us on LinkedIn and, and with that um, I'd like to thank all of you for joining today thank you to everybody who responded um, to the survey and provided uh, your valuable insight to this year's barometer and finally a very special thank you to our President Juliet Davenport and trustee Rob Gross for joining us for a very uh, interesting debate today thank you and have a good rest of the day thank you Nick